I'm a feminist, but I'm interrupting the beginning of my own podcast to say that we are coming on the Guilty Feminist live tour, sequined, singing, dancing, comedy, and interviewing local feminists in your hometown. This week, on the 1st of May, we're in Halifax. Then we are on the 2nd, we're in Birmingham. Then we're in Hull, Newcastle, and Salford. This is the first week. But check out guiltyfeminist.com for all of the dates. Guests this week include Sin V, Alison Spittle, Jess Robinson, uh, who you might know from Britain's Got Talent, Felicity Ward, and Kemar Bob. Please come out and see us. We would absolutely love to see you there. It's going to be a real celebration of feminism and an inspiring night. Also, I just wanted to let you know that today's guest is a bit different. She's a character comedian. And it's the first time we've ever had an ironic character come on the podcast. So I hope you enjoy it. It's something a bit different. It's something for variety. I am a massive fan of Effie because I grew up with her. If you're not in Australia or New Zealand, you will not probably know the character, but you will know something like the Kumars and you'll understand the idea. I really, really think you're going to enjoy this episode. So have fun, buckle up. Cal Wilson and I were in Sydney. We had the most magnificent time. Thank you to everyone who came out to the Australian shows in Sydney and Melbourne, Brisbane and Auckland, New Zealand as well. We just had an absolute blast with you all. You were the best, best audiences. Uh, So I I'm delighted to bring you this episode now. Thank you. I'm a feminist, but sometimes when life gets complicated and romantic arguments occur in my friendship group, I think, I'm not sure I understand women. (laughs) You're sure they're not just French? (laughs) What are you saying about French people? Don't get xenophobic. We've got Brexit. We can't afford comments like that. You should, just, the you, French should, up you should be cross with me for assuming you can't speak French. But instead you're like, oh, you're racist. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but if we have visitors and the house is untidy, I feel it reflects badly on me, not my husband. I've been practicing saying, I'm so sorry about the mess. We're just in the middle of always living like this. <laughs> I've been to your house. It's not messy at all. It's immaculate. This is I only let you go in one room, though, didn't I? That is true. There was a limited tour. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but today I had my hair colour done. And I asked the hairdresser, out of interest, did he think that I could go Jennifer Aniston blonde? Because I think Jennifer Aniston originally had the same hair colour as me. And he said... Well, it'll be quite hard for you because she must be in her late 50s now, so she'll be mostly grey, whereas you've only got 20 grey hairs. And I was unaccountably thrilled. (laughs) Even though I knew full well that Jennifer Aniston had turned 50 just this week, I did not correct him. (laughs) I was like, no, she's got everything. (laughs) I'm having this. I am not grey enough to be Jennifer Aniston. She's going to be absolutely devastated when she listens to this episode. (laughs) Someone might send it to her. If you're listening, Jen, we'd love you to come on. I'm a feminist, but when I was getting in an Uber at the airport today, I apologised for my bag being too heavy, and the male driver said, that's not heavy, and instead of saying nothing, I went, oh, you must be much stronger than me. (laughs) Like I actually simpered, oh, I'm so adorable and weak. Could have just let him put it in the boot instead of like, <laughs> muscles. <laughs> it's a reflex. Well, he was about to drive me at speed somewhere, so I didn't mm. want to piss him off too much. No. I know that feeling. I know that feeling, being nice to drivers. Stop calling your husband a driver. <laughs> you look familiar. Have I had you before? <laughs> But whenever I do the, the podcast with you, I feel like I turn into Basil Brush. <laughs> hey, 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 Miss Deborah, hey. I'm a feminist, but earlier tonight at the dressing room, I said I can always spot my audience in a bar before the show because they look like feminists. <laughs> but you know what I mean. No. Firstly, there's a lot of feminist T-shirts. I'm not saying I can tell all of you. But I reckon if I had to pick half out of a lineup, I'd just be like, yeah, one of mine. I'm a 
feminist, but when I found out we're not able to do the Guilty Feminist at this venue tomorrow night because it's been booked by Mr. Pole Dancing Australia, I thought I might just turn up anyway. That is the reason we're doing Friday and Sunday and not Friday and Saturday, is, is that tomorrow night it's the Mr. Pole Dance Championships. See, I love the thought of that because I just think dudes on poles are just man kebabs. What? They're man kebabs. Man kebabs. Man kebabs. Live from the factory theatre. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and... Inter- oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that $3,000 that times. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you want us to say it together like it's a little prayer? <laughs> that would be weird, but sure. <laughs> this, this is, is the, the Guilty, Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century, century feminists and, and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Today I am here talking about feminist marriage in unison with Cal Wilson. The guilty <laughs> feminists love you, Cal. I don't know what to say. I think you can leave it at that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Very wooey already, I've noticed. Sydney's woo! Sydney's all about that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like the way you've set each other off. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Melbourne's very excited, but a lower tone. It's much more woo. Woo. Yes. Mm. Woo. I see what you did there. Woo. woo. It's like I'm, more... I'm dressed in black, but woo. I do have a personality. Woo. 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 It's a lot more ghostly, woo. isn't it? Woo. woo. Incidentally, it's also the noise my cat makes when it's got one particular toy. It's got this fluffy ball, and if it puts it in his mouth, he keeps you away from him by going... It's the only time Barnacle makes that noise. Ghost cat. We're talking about marriage today, Cal. Oh, this is so sudden, Deborah. (laughs) We're talking about feminist marriage. Can marriage be feminist, etc.? Um... They've turned. They've They've turned. turned. (laughs) They've turned. Give us a cheer if you are, in fact, married. Give us a cheer if you're in a long-term relationship but are not married. Give us a cheer if you're single. Didn't mean to bring it up so close to Valentine's Day, I'm sorry. (laughs) Valentine's Day was yesterday. If you're listening to this on the podcast, you are in the future. But we're still very much in the hearts and chocolates zone. Uh, did your husband send you anything or give you anything for Valentine's Day? Uh, he bought a new kettle and said you can have that for Valentine's Day. Because we don't, we don't do Valentine's Day, so I bought... He bought a, a new kettle? Because that kettle was fucked and he bought a new kettle. You can't say, oh, we need a new kettle. But we're we just we not don't, doing Valentine's we Day. We don't do Valentine's yeah, Day. Because I think it's shit. Sure. Um, and so he just bought a new kettle and arrived on Valentine's Day and he went, you can have that for Valentine's Day. And we laughed our asses off. Because I... Like, Oh, well, see, then the romance is alive. And then, I, gave I... Him, I gave him a stubby holder that I'd bought on a ship. <laughs> Spent three dollars on him. If you're listening internationally, it's important to know that a stubby is a beer here. <laughs> <laughs> what is it where you live, Deborah? <laughs> it's, it's not, again, my mother is in. That's going to be my catchphrase tonight. Um, so, yeah, you have been married... Be- many times. Many times. Well, yeah, twice. T- twice. Twice. Everyone's allowed to practice. Yeah. I, I've been married twice, too, but to the same man. Oh. Mm. Well, are you just very absent-minded? <laughs> no, not, not, it wasn't an Elizabeth Taylor situation, just to be very clear. We got married very early on because I had some visa issues... Oh, it's a govern- green card scenario. Well, yeah, but no, but everyone says that. It's not, though, because we were together. It wasn't like we got married for a green card and then fell in love, like in the story. We were already in love. 
And, but it was just very early into our relationship. How, how many minutes? <laughs> three, th- three weeks. Three weeks? Um, you look, you're looking no, at me look, casually as if I'll immigration t- could still get you. Well, okay. I was looking for a nice gay man to marry me because we didn't have equal marriage then. It was the 90s. Uh, so I was looking for a nice gay man to marry me because that, in those days, that's what Antipodean girls did. They found a nice gay man. And then there was one of two things. Either you'd pay them or you would meet their mum and she'd get to go to a wedding. Oh. And it was a beard option. Wow. I know, I know. I would love the thought of you getting married in a beard. <laughs> <laughs> and since that time, gay men have now opted to selfishly marry each other, <laughs> ruling out this loophole for many women in this audience who would have liked to have... You know. I feel like you're telling this story very carefully as if it's the first time that Tom is hearing this. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he's, he's heard it. Um, and <laughs> then we got married properly in 2008 and all of our friends and family came, which was really nice. And Tom always says the difference in the two weddings was quite stark because in the first one it was just... We only had four friends there as witnesses... And when the celebrant said, does anyone here know of any reason why these two people shouldn't be getting married? Everyone looked at the door to see if Tom's father would come in. Because he had said if he could find out where it was going to be, he would stop it. Oh. So it was genuine jeopardy. In 2008, when we got married, got married at my old Oxford college. So after that, I went to university and we got married at my old Oxford college. And um, when the, uh, what was the, the uh, what do they call it at the college? Chaplain. When the chaplain... You could have made up any word and we would have gone, yep, that's what they do at Oxford. <laughs> when the bebop... Um... When the matrician came in, yeah. holding yeah. the fnodagel... Yes. <laughs> ...and waved his fnork at everyone. Ah, We knew well, it was time the chaplain, to cut the bling. I, I, you're assuming it was a man, but the chaplain was a woman oh, all along. Oh, exciting. Yes, yes, it's terribly modern. When the chaplain said, I now pronounce you husband and wife... Everyone cheered for so long, because people had known us as a couple forever, so everyone cheered for so long that she had to stop them. Everyone was, she had to go, okay, that's enough now. I just went around turning off the lights and closing the curtains and yeah. going, yeah. I've got another one in ten minutes, you'll have to... Yeah. So I have been married twice to the same man, but sometimes we say, a lot of our really close friends who we love now, we didn't know them then, so they weren't at our wedding, so we have talked about doing a third. Oh, I like that We do it every ten years. Because I also would wear a different dress now. It's just such a commitment, isn't it, at your wedding? And you only get to do it once. I mean, I'm just saying, I think it should just be a ten-yearly thing. Have like, come... not you have to renew it, like your passport. Yeah, like, uh, like your driver's license. It expires. Yeah. But this time you want to look well, like you do in the photos. Well, that, yes, but that's good too. Because it should be, I think now, monogamy was great when people lived to 32. Are you listening, Tom? Are you listening? No, no. I mean, it, that's true, though. It's got, I mean, it's, monogamy was invented for people who got married at 16 and died by 30. And it was always meant to be a 14-year situation. <laughs> so I say, every 14 years, by law, you are automatically released from your vows. No questions asked. Just walk off into the night, if you like. You have an option to renew. And you at least have to send an email. You're reckoning, though, that, like, you know, because you're going to be dead at 32, so you can imagine conversations with people like, well, it was either have an affair or get the plague. (laughs) That's right, yeah. People just died of all sorts. People just died of being medieval, you know. (laughs) It was just everything wanted to kill you then. And So all I'm saying is, we're now, many of us are going to live in this room, we'll live to over 100 there has just realised she's not as happy in her marriage as she yeah. thought. She thought, I'm 26, I can't do this till I'm married too early. What, I, what I'm finding entertaining at the moment is my parents have been married for 55 years and they get on very well but my mum has started to openly heckle my father. Oh. Like, because mum likes to talk and dad likes to talk but dad is louder than mum so dad gets to talk more and oh. so the only time he's silent is when he's choosing food and so he's, at, like when we have like a Christmas dinner or something he's lining up at the bench putting stuff on his plate and she's like, oh look at him, God he's slow. Oh, I've been here for hours, like Uncle Stan, hurry it up. Like she's just totally heckling him, it's brilliant. 
she's really great actually as she's got older she gets her words mixed up a little bit so we were on the phone once and she goes oh I've got something to tell you but it's completely blown my mind <laughs> and I like the thought that it had blown her mind like she just had some like she had a, like an acid flashback or something I was like fuck I don't know and then we were having a conversation not long ago and she was reading a TV guide and she goes oh, I don't know what, I've, I just don't know what this word is what's miniseries oh and I mean, do you mean M- miniseries? miniseries. <laughs> but now we've decided that miniseries is when you're just slightly depressed. You know, mm. oh, I've got the miniseries. Yeah, you're depressed for the duration a miniseries yeah. would run. Yeah, like for half an hour each night, you're just a bit down. <laughs> for six weeks. Oh, I've got the miniseries again. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Guilty Feminist, briefly interrupting the podcast to say that we're teaming up with Amnesty International to revive The Secret Policeman. Now, if you don't know what The Secret Policeman is, Amnesty International put on these amazing, amazing, amazing comedy shows. It comes out about once a decade and it started with Monty Python. And we are reviving the brand to make sure that the lineup of comedians most reflects those whose human rights are most routinely eroded or in fact taken away. And these shows are going to be the absolute bomb. On the 5th of June at the Hackney Empire in London is the first Secret Policeman's tour show. The lineup so far is Sindhu V, Funbi Omateo, Grace Petrie, Juliet Stevenson, Francesca Martinez, Desiree Birch, Jessica Fosterkew, Alison Spittle, Kima Bob, and Siobhan McSweeney, who's Sister Michael from Derry Girls. You are going to have the most rocking time, so get tickets for that. You can find details on the website. Also, Belfast, we're finally coming to you to record a podcast on the 8th of June, 7 p.m. at Limelight. Do not miss it. I wanted to say thank you to everyone who came out to Say My Name screenings. I appreciate it so much. Thank you to Odeon for having us. I hope there'll be more screenings and that Say My Name movie will be out soon on streaming as well. But I really appreciate everyone who came out. Effie's going to tell you the dates that she's touring live in Australia at the end of the episode. But I wanted to let you know that she's put on some extra dates since we recorded this because the show's been selling so well. So to find out when and where Effie's playing, go to maryandeffie.com. Go and check her out live. You will not regret it. It's a phenomenal show. And finally, my book, The Guilty Feminist, is out in paperback on Thursday. You can pre-order it from Waterstones. They've got some very special flash ones, or you can pre-order it in other bookshops or outlets. And I want to let you know, excitingly, the paperback has a little extra. There are interviews from the amazing Phoebe Waller-Bridge from Fleabag and who wrote Killing Eve and also the wonderful Hannah Gadsby from The Net. So fresh new interviews in the paperback, and also you can throw it in your bag, take it on the tube. Uh, It's not as heavy. So check out the paperback, and you can also get it uh, live at any of our tour dates. It'll be available in the foyer. So I hope to see you at some of the tour dates very, very soon. And now back to the podcast. Are you ready for some stand-up comedy? Then please welcome to the stage the excellent Carl Wilson! So, we're talking about feminist marriage tonight and I believe that I do have a feminist marriage because there's a feminist in it and there's a man who's willing to learn. I was thinking about all different aspects of marriage. I was thinking, you know, in the words of our Lord Beyonce, if you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it. Unless what you liked was my wooden coffee table and the ring you put on it was from your cup of tea. (laughs) Then also, in the words of rabid feminist Frank Sinatra, love and marriage, love and marriage. They go together like a horse and carriage. Do they though, Frank? Do they really? I mean, maybe they do go together like a horse and carriage because once you're hitched, one of you is always putting all the effort in, dragging the other one round to places they never go by themselves. And then at midnight, one of you turns into a pumpkin. I mean, this is not about marriage, but Frank Sinatra has form for annoying songs. So uh, I really hate my way because that song starts off, regrets, I've had a few, but then too few to mention. 
Why bring it up? <laughs> no one was talking about regrets and then Frank's like, guys, 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 shh, guys, 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 shh. I've got some regrets. I'm not gonna tell you about them. Like, it's just attention seeking. It's like when someone posts on Facebook, well, that was the worst day ever. I guess you just can't trust people. And then eventually someone else is like, oh, for fuck's sake, are you okay, huh? <laughs> and then the first person is always like, mm, I don't want to talk about it on Facebook. Let's <laughs> so fuck off back to the moon and stars with Frank Sinatra, as far as I'm concerned. But we were talking about marriage. So, sometimes people describe marriage as two becoming one. And I don't really like that, because it just makes me think of Jeff Goldblum and the fly. Like, marriage turns you into some terrible insect-human-mutant hybrid. I'm afraid, don't be afraid. No, be afraid, be very afraid. No one's seen the fly apart from me. <laughs> Sometimes I think people confuse marriage with a wedding. Uh, and when I say people, I mean me. Uh, which is how I ended up on a bunch of wedding sites, which said things like, why not make things special by releasing doves at your wedding? But what does releasing doves actually symbolise? It just looks like you're having a clean-out at a pet shop. Apparently, according to this website, Japanese weddings often include origami cranes because cranes represent peace, happiness, and a lot of construction in the city centre. <laughs> There's lots of weird traditions that people have, like the bouquet toss or the groom removing the bride's garter with his teeth, which is so weird. She's sitting there in a chair. She's got her leg out, and he looks like a horse trying to nibble hay through a gate. <laughs> explain what I just did there, podcast listeners. You'll just have to be really furious that you weren't in the room, but geez, it was good. <laughs> so I've got a husband that I like now. I've had the practice one. I've got my one that I'm going to keep. I'm, I am happily married. He's not, but 50% is a pass. <laughs> he's, um, he's lovely, but I don't like the word husband because I think it sounds too ownershipy, like my husband. I don't like it, but, but there's, I, I don't know what the better alternatives are. Like if I say that I've got a partner, I feel like I'm being deliberately misleading. Like you might look at me and go, oh, she's got a partner. They're called Chris. She's got short hair. Oh, it might be a woman. And then it's like, oh, it's a guy. She's so fucking vanilla. <laughs> the word I really hate though for husband, I really hate the word hubby. I just hate the word hubby. Oh, it is a word crime, the word hubby. I hate it. Hubby, how's your hubby? So I just visualise a fat little hippopotamus in a tutu just <laughs> dancing around. So I try to think, what am I going to call my husband? Because I love him, I adore him, he's a beautiful man. He's like my sexy friend. Like, I love, it's a weird description, but um, <laughs> he doesn't listen, he'll never hear it. So um, I was like, well, how do, what, what can I think up a new word for my husband? And so I've started calling him my fuckle. Because <laughs> I mean, that's kind of cute, it sounds kind of friendly and a bit sexy. Like, this is my fuckle. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't go down so well at parent-teacher interviews, though. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Johnson, this is my fuckle. Um, but really, what do I know about marriage? I've only had two. Like, you wouldn't call someone a pilot if they'd only flown twice. So I've looked for some inspiration to a really valuable tome. This was published in 1956. It's called Woman's World. It was published in Melbourne. It's called Woman's World, not Women's World, because you only want one, otherwise they get together and ruin things. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to read you a few excerpts from it. I've written them out, though, because that's so heavy. I cannot carry it with my tiny girl arms. You're much stronger than me. So right, for those of you who are listening to this on the podcast, I, I have to stress how hefty this book is. Like, it's heavy enough that if you dropped it on the patriarchy, it would kill it instantly. <laughs> brilliant pieces of advice under many headings. For example, under femininity. Though a man may admire the brilliant, aggressive woman with a mind like a man, he seldom takes her dancing. <laughs> under a stimulating mind, we find the woman with something extra is interesting because she is interested. She uses all her five senses with fervour. She asks herself, what is that child dreaming about? Is that man happy with his wife? What about flying saucers anyway? What do pets think of people? She is never bored. Or, by the sound of things, sober. I love the thought. I love the thought. 
thought of someone using all of their five senses with fervour, especially when you're meeting new people and some poor man's going, oh, look, please excuse my wife, she's just tasting the waiter. Darling, <laughs> darling, don't, darling, don't smell there. You can listen, but don't touch. So many great sections. There's hints for happy housekeeping. There's a chapter entitled Obstetric Table, which I think is a Norwegian electronica band. Um, there's a section entitled Your Box, which I was like, oh, that sounds saucy. Um, just about collecting bed linen. But let's see what Woman's World has to say about marriage. He's popped the question. At least he thought he did, although you probably manoeuvred him into it. Manoeuvred him into it like he's a spider under a glass. Once he's popped the question, slide a piece of paper under him, whisk him outside and shake him out in the garden. <laughs> then we have a chapter entitled Marital Problems, uh, which has the subheading of The Working Wife. I think you're getting the gist of it. Uh, it is virtually the custom now that after marriage, the young wife goes back to work until the arrival of children or until sufficient money has been saved for a home or for expensive household appliances which lead her to the status of full-time housewife. Or indeed a real housewife of Sydney. <laughs> Whatever the reason, there are dangers to a marriage when the wife works. But what sort of, what sort of dangers? Like, is she a professional axe thrower or something or a... She's a crock wrestler who likes to bring her work home with her. <laughs> Whatever the reason, there are dangers to a marriage when the wife works, more especially when the wife is young and perhaps more physically energetic than the older, more sedate, middle-aged woman. <laughs> what, what are these dangers? Like, like what, is the, what is the young, more physically energetic wife up to? Is she like a lioness on the plains and she's trying to hunt down some bachelor gazelles or something? <laughs> Like she's got too much energy out there for fucking someone else that's not her husband. I think that's the underlying message. And then this is possibly my favourite. Authorities are agreed that incalculable harm can be done to children whose mothers work full time. Especially if they come home carrying bits of gazelle in their teeth. The causes of the harm are obvious enough. The children after school are left to their own devices or the vague supervision of a neighbour until a mother gets home from work each evening. I really love the vague supervision of a neighbour. Like, <laughs> the neighbour is like so wasted that they're just... Yeah, no, I thought they were out there. It turned out to be the wheelie bin. My bad. Uh... But also, I think, you know, kids these days are left to their own devices, but this time it's just iPads. Uh... On the other hand, a part-time job can offer the mother of a school-aged family both stimulation and extra pocket money. I don't want pocket money, I want a fucking pocket. That's what I want, pockets. <laughs> Men are usually more generous-minded than women, but they don't like giving in after a quarrel. The wise wife will always make the first move of reconciliation. This is just part of the job of being a woman, a job wives must never forget. I've got to admit, though, that after a fight, I do make the first move, uh, and my first move is to sulk. Um, I can keep it up for hours, uh, but I've, it's not very effective because he doesn't realise that I'm sulking. Um, he doesn't recognise the silent treatment. He just thinks the argument has finished. He thinks... It's done. I'm radiating this cold, silent fury at him, and he's just going, well, that was sorted out. <laughs> so, the, the thing that I really find um, interesting about my husband is that he feels no need to debrief. Like, once something has happened, it's happened, and then we can... It's like he resets to zero every time. One of my favourite things about going to a party is debriefing after the party in the car. Like, that's my favourite thing, like, because you get to say stuff like, oh, my God, I can't believe they've called their daughter Chalcedony, or, you know... Um, <laughs> Did you see Greg's face when he realised that he'd eaten a dog biscuit? Like, it's something like, like... But he's quite happy. He's quite happy to just go home in the car and just not think about what's... It. Like, someone could crash a giraffe into a swimming pool and he would feel no need to talk about it afterwards. Um, somehow, a clever wife manages to remain something of an enigma, if not a mystery to her husband. It keeps him on his toes to feel there is still something he does not quite know about her. Like her name or what she does for a job. <laughs> I like the idea that he comes home just as she's climbing out the back window wearing a cat suit. <laughs> I would totally be up there. Like he'd wake up in the morning and I'd just have a different accent. 
I think he'd quite like that, actually. Uh, <laughs> or, like, you know, like, he's like, why are you talking funny? He'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and he gets ready for bed and comes into the bedroom and I'm just hanging upside down from the ceiling like a bat. <laughs> I love the way that I should be an enigma to my husband. I think what Woman's World is essentially telling me is that I should be a spy. Uh, as long as I only do it for pocket money. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, that thing about men not deconstructing. I'm not, I know you weren't saying men, you were saying your husband, but I also have that issue. Does anyone else have a husband, boyfriend, partner, or brother, father, anyone's friend in their life that is a cisgendered man, straight man, obviously, <laughs> who will not deconstruct on the way home? Yeah. And who has no need to talk things through at length? It, it or, must be, it or must even be. short. Must be so quiet in there. Like, what are they doing? Just roomy. There's a couple of sofas. Like, what are they thinking about when they won't just? The only way I can deal with it, because Chris doesn't like to talk about movies after they're finished. So I've just weird. I have to talk about them during the movie. Like I'm just. Oh yeah. (laughs) Which I I didn't realise I was doing until we had friends over to watch a TV show, and I was like, Jesus, I'm talking a fuck of a lot. Like just. (laughs) But afterwards, I could talk to them while he was like. So he's happy for you to... Well, Tom and I have a thing. This is a real marriage thing. The thing is, the truth is, there's little kind of couple things that if he did with anyone else, it would be completely over. And one of them is something called House Stradamus. So when we were watching... When the, the long-running show House, when that was on, if one of us had a theory as to what was wrong with the person or we could solve the mystery, we'd pause it and go, House Stradamus. And we'd make it like a Nostradamus prediction. And that's turned into, we can do Nostradamus yeah, on a house yeah. on anything. And, you know, we could just do good place Stradamus, basically. And sometimes the puns work better than others. But that, if I knew, if I, like, honestly, we went together a long time. I would hope he wouldn't hook up with anyone else, but just say he did. It wouldn't be the end of the world. But if he did house Stradamus with someone else, over. Yeah. Because that's the true intimacy. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah, yeah like the little, little tiny couple, things. Yeah. Like Chris for me is um, if I say something that he doesn't believe needs a response, but I do. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, hey, like you say something, you just want acknowledgement. He's invented a noise, and the noise is. <laughs> <laughs> so that tells me that he's listening, but does not feel it requires a response. <laughs> <laughs> Now, there are a lot of men who listen to this podcast who are straight men in relationships who are going to adopt that now. And that's your fault, Cal. Oh, God, it's going to be like there's a herd of owls everywhere. <laughs> Don't spread it. Our guest today is a star of stage and screen and a household name in Australia. Now, she means a lot to me because she was on the television being a powerful feminist woman in the late 80s, early 90s, before there were many archetypes of really powerful feminist women. I, personally, am a huge fan of her sitcom, Acropolis Now. (laughs) But if you're listening in the UK, uh, this amazing woman was also in the Australian equivalent of the Kumars called Greeks on the Roof, (laughs) which will contextualise her. Please welcome to the stage... The Logie Award winning megastar that is Effie! Hello, good thanks. So good to be here. Well, Effie, it is really genuinely remarkable to have you here. And you are, for me, a feminist icon. Thank you. Well, look, the way I look at it is I don't apologise unless I've done something wrong. That's the only time you, know, uh, you have to apologise as a woman is when you've done something wrong. The rest of the time, I'm pretty up myself. 
have you done anything wrong lately? I think wrong thoughts, <laughs> like most of us. I try not to do the wrong thing. You know, I've been quite um, conservative morally, should I put that that way, or physically even. <laughs> I've spent a huge part of my life being very frigid, <laughs> paranoid, you know. But I lack experience in certain departments, if you know what I'm saying. No, I, I think we all know now. I think it's, I think it's clear. Uh, do you have an I'm a feminist but, Effie? Oh, yes, I do. So excited about this moment. I'm a feminist but I like the guys to pay. I just saw two of our audience members do cheers to each other when you said that. <laughs> Like Listen, the way one. I look at it is this. I'm tight. <laughs> Even though it's not politically right. I don't go Dutch, I go Greek. <laughs> and, you know, this gender pay gap, which shits me big time, <laughs> I figure they've got extra money to pay for me. Truth be known is we pay a lot for a great asset. So I figure, you know, I'm an investment for them. You know, I make them look good. I look good myself. But I'll make them look good. By standing adjacent. Exactly. By smelling the same, you know, oxygen. <laughs> by being in my aura. By having the privilege of being with an original. There's no, there's no question. No question. There's no question on the original front. So, Effie, you look incredible tonight. Thank you. When you go out on a date with a guy, do you expect him to dress up as well or are you providing all of the glamour? Oh, you're gorgeous. Nah, listen, life is a visual medium. <laughs> you know, I like people with, you know, excess pride. <laughs> so I expect the guy to polish up. You know, I expect a guy to put in a bit of effort. I mean, unless he has the most incredible personality and charisma, like ever. You know, I can't imagine how I would even look twice at a slob. I want someone to, you know, to make an effort. I make a big effort and I expect somebody else to make one too. Yeah, no, that's not unreasonable. I believe you found such a man who would make efforts um, because you've been single for a long time yes. and you have found the right man and you have got married. Deborah, I might add, not only was I single, but I was still a virgin. <laughs> That's very much what you were hinting at earlier, Effie. <laughs> There's an asset. I'd invested in that as a term deposit. <laughs> and I knew one day I would be rolled over. Let me say, um, you know, I'd shopped around. You know, for a long time I was extremely picky. But what happens with that is, it's not a lot of distance between picky and desperate. <laughs> you start to get a stench about you. You know, I've been sitting on that shelf, accumulating dust, used by day, possibly gone, even though I don't buy any of that. But other people do. You know, people, you get a sense that people are going, eh, what's up with you? Like, like that, like there was something wrong with me because I wasn't putting out, because I wasn't getting hooked up with, because I wasn't, you know, committing on any level. Was this before the sort of Tinder generation? But... <laughs> was that a compliment? <laughs> Well, like, well, so was I. Like, I was, there was no yes. teacher when I was, you yes. know, doing that thing. So, certainly there was no Tinder to a certain point, but I only recently got married. Oh, so, so you did go was... into... Did you use Tinder? No. I mean, when I say no... <laughs> I mean, I'm fortunate that I've got a very generous bestie that likes to put out all the time. You know. I'm not sure what you mean now. I, I, I won't lie. Well, her nickname's 7-Eleven because she's always open, you know. She's one of those sort of, you know, modern women that likes to 
get out and have a good time. You know, I've had her, she's been my bestie since school. Is, is she? And she's on Tinder. Right. So she's always telling me, oh, my God, check this out, look at this message, whatever. And I have looked over her shoulder on many occasions. I might have given her some, you know, things to, to put in a text to send. You know, so I've lived vicariously through her slutty ambitions. <laughs> Her, you know, her want to be a, a modern woman in every sense. You know, free, like yeah. a hippie from the waist down. <laughs> you know, so I know about Tinder through her. Also, I've got a very sleazy uncle who's on <laughs> Tinder as well. It seems the world is on Tinder. Yes, absolutely. Just give us a cheer if you're on Tinder. <laughs> uh, give us a cheer if you're on something like Tinder but not Tinder. <laughs> It's the same people. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Give it... <laughs> it's very much the same people. The problem I have with it is that I would never be interested in someone who was just someone who's horny and adjacent. And I need them really. Are you saying that you want brain tender? Like, so you want yes. people to be interested in your yes. mind. Yes, so and just sort called... of connection. I want that sort of chemistry. So it'd be connection. called Minder rather than Tinder. <laughs> yes. I don't know, Effie, what do you think? Do you feel like what? you want that person to be connected to you when they see you? If you sort of, when they have that connection with you? Because just from a picture, I just don't think... Well, listen, this is the way I see Tinder. And this is why, you know, for someone as paranoid as me... A control freak, oh, I don't want people saying stuff about me. I don't want people having photos, inappropriate anything on me. You know, Tinder is like if you can imagine their penises are like an Uber. <laughs> and they're driving to a location near them. You know, and they're looking to park that vehicle. Sure, I've got it. So marriage, on to marriage, you've, you've recently got married. Yes. Um, how are you finding it? Well, I love it. And let me say this. I went to my school reunion, my 25-year school reunion, torture. <laughs> you know, and I get there and it's the last place I want to be because... When you go to those things, you know, as romantic as you want to get about the past, there are some realities that come with the past. Like, you know, the people you didn't like or the people that you copped it off or tried to, you know, like all that ugliness. And I encountered, you know, people from my past that I didn't want to see that were trying to stick it to me, and I don't mean physically. I'm talking about chicks that, you know... Oh, now that I'm a megastar, a Logie Award-winning national icon, <laughs> they can't hack it, right? Because they put me down when I was at school because I was different. No biggie, we all are. No problem. And now I go to this 25-year reunion and I'm single. Could you believe that? I mean, that's a crime against humanity. <laughs> There's someone like me, you know, is only the lonely, you know, just everywhere, like an orphan walking around on my own everywhere. Did you meet anyone at the reunion who was interested and showed that interest, or could you not trust it because you're a Logie Award-winning megastar? Of course, I'm going to be cynical. And it doesn't help when I turn up to this reunion and everyone else is bragging about how they're married. And how they've got holiday houses and they married a lawyer. And what are you doing? You sitting on a Logie? <laughs> Is that how you're getting your thrills? <laughs> and for the record, I don't. So I'm there and I look in the worst moment, you know, where all this bitchiness is happening and all this, you know, competitive stuff is going on. And I look over and I see the boy I kissed. My <gasps> first kiss. Oh. And I look over and there he is. Shane Bradley Cooper. <laughs> and he literally starts walking towards me. And everything goes into slow-mo. 
and I'll start hearing, shine your name across my heart. I want you to be my baby. It happened like in the movies, except in my eyes. And he came over and we started dancing and that was it. And it was him. And it was him. Shane my Bradley first Cooper. ever kiss, Shane Bradley Cooper. And what about this? For coincidence, he's become a legend as well. So I'm this, you know, award-winning virgin. <laughs> and he's a plastic surgeon. He's gone off and had this career, became a doctor and, you know, married someone, didn't work out and said that he's never, ever gotten over me. Oh. Did you believe it? No. <laughs> but yes. But yes. And I remember the first kiss vividly. I remember, you know, he smelled like Nutella. <laughs> and I smelled like mortadella. <laughs> it was, you know, a clash of cultures. But somehow in that, in that clash, in that opposites attract, you know, Paula Abdul sort of way. <laughs> Something, there was an alchemy and that stood the test of time, obviously. Yeah. So the two of you... We got married. Yeah. And it was, uh, that was another big drama. Because all got a mother who wanted me, obviously, to marry a Greek who'd been threatening suicide my whole life if I was to ever not marry a Greek. She was going to jump off the harbour bridge except she doesn't drive and she wanted us to drive her there. <laughs> That's what Greek mothers do, you know, they got gold medals in emotional blackmail. So, so did, did Shane Bradley win her over? Oh yeah, he did because, you know, he's a bit loaded. <laughs> and of course, you know, my mother then started bragging about, oh, my daughter's gonna marry a doctor and, and that sort of got rid of this whole Greek thing because she wasn't gonna win that argument because I'd fallen in love with this Skippy guy, you know, love knows no, no gender, no race, no, you know, I've, no, it's class, I wanted someone rich, <laughs> not stupid. <laughs> you know. I'd been looking for love for a long time. <laughs> you know, and so I got what I wanted and she finally got what she wanted, which was access to, you know, a lot of gifting from him. <laughs> And what, can we ask what the wedding was like? It was massive. It was massive. My mother invited everyone she'd ever accepted to go to their kid's wedding. I had to invite them. So it was like, I don't know, we had like 470 on my side. And you know what skips are like? You know, they, they had, you know, a handful of people turn up. <laughs> Does skippy mean... Um, Kangaroo. Yeah. Aussie. Anglo. Anglo Aussie. Aussie, yeah, we grew up, well, we were being called wogs, which I know in the UK is a terrible word, as it was here. Um, but it was reclaimed by the we, Greek and Italian population. That's right. We detoxified that word. We took it back. We gave it a facelift. We put it out there. And uh, we use your, it as a term of affection. Your husband could do that now. What's that? The, the facelift. Your husband could oh, do exactly. that now. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. So while well, they called us wog, which was really offensive, you know, growing up, because it was a way of saying you're different, you know, you're greasy, you stink, and some of those things were true. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, we called them skippy, which I think is quite cute. Yeah, it is very yeah, cute. It implies that they have tiny arms as well, which is <laughs> nice. Well, also that they could save you if you were lost down a well. True, absolutely true. Yeah. Or a fighter man off with their powerful legs <laughs> as well. Um, so, Ify, what were your vows like? Well, you know, we, we, um, we had to get married in the Greek Orthodox Church because, you know, you know some things you just got to do, don't you? And, um, you know, and he was up for all of that. Um, his mother's she's got a drinking problem, but that's another story anyway. <laughs> You know, his father had a midlife crisis, went off with the secretary and the mother's been getting boob jobs and, you know, Botox and everything else, you know, taking advantage of her son's abilities ever since. And she hits the Chardonnay like you wouldn't believe. So we had to, 
have a security guard just watching her <laughs> the whole time. It was dramatic. There were moments, you know, my mother insisted on a fur coat because she'd always wanted a fur coat, you know, even though it was 42 degrees and she blacks out, so we've got the ambulance there. It was a drama. You know, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, it was a very fruitful event. Mm. I'd uh, set up, you know, I mean, when you at a certain age, you can't expect people to keep buying your toasters and, and all that stuff, especially when you can get cash. So I just said, no, nah, we're set up, you know, domestically. So I set up, um, you know, like the wedding registry was with Westpac. <laughs> Which is a you know, very large bank. Very large here. bank if you're listing abroad. And you yeah. know, I gave him the account number during you know the speeches, just because I <laughs> yeah sure. Which was of course Effie Super Fund. Yeah. Uh, and I gave you know they got a text with all the details, and you yeah. know it was it was good. You know I see that as my super. Completely. And are you settling into marriage life? I am. Look, it has its adjustments because you know it's so exciting in the lead up, mm. isn't it? So much to organise, you can't believe it's happening, you f can't believe you found him and, you know, and then you can't believe you're having sex for the first time, you know, and I was very nervous. So I'd done a lot of research and I'd seen stuff that, you know, I, I couldn't, I, I would have to psychologically scrub my memory in the shower with some of the um, things I stumbled across in terms of what people get up to in that department because I didn't want to disappoint my husband, nor did I want to disappoint myself. So, um... <laughs> And you know what? Turns out I'm an excellent route. <laughs> there you go. Who would have thought? Good, good to know. Good to know. So then you fall into a routine, you know. It gets, mm. it gets quite domestic. Mm. And then you wonder what else is there to look forward to. You know. And my husband's such a great guy. You know. Anything I want, does for me, gets for me. And when he does... All of that starts to shit me. <laughs> what is it with us? What is it with us? Because I believe men fall in love with a woman and they want that woman to stay the same forever. We fall in love with men and we go, we could just renovate him just a little bit. <laughs> just give him a slap and a tickle. Just do a man reno on a couple of those things that that don't work for me. Yeah, I often think, I only know how to be married to Tom Selinsky. I've got no experience in being married to anyone else. And I can't imagine now leaving him for someone else and having to learn all of that over again. Like somebody else's quirks and how to please that person. Because, I mean, that would be exhausting. I've just got this one right. And it is one of those things. It's like you put so much into something, you're not prepared to say goodbye to our history and all of that, you know. There's a lot, we romanticise, you know, our past in many ways and we want to make sure, you know, it ends up becoming a great legacy that we leave behind. My grandmother, I would call her a feminist, never wore a bra in her life. <laughs> she used to chase her empty breasts around the waistband of her apron. <laughs> she said to me, a man should only know a woman from the waist down. I would not call her a feminist. <laughs> I would argue with that. She says a man shouldn't know how a woman thinks. Like, our mind is our own. We can share from the waist down, but not the brain. That is ours. And we don't let anyone screw with that. I think that's where she was coming from See, on that I was, yeah, I was taking you a bit literally, so that a man should only know us from the waist down would make it difficult, like, meeting people in the street. Um, whether not, like, oh, hello, like, you know. Oh, Mrs Carter, I didn't recognise you. <laughs> Tom, early on in my relationship with Tom, he said... Um, he said, if I ever make you less than you are, leave me. Because a relationship oh should make God, you more than you are. Oh, my God, I'm in love with him are. too now. Yeah, and he always said, unless I'm... The relationship should make you more than you are, braver, bolder, more oh, capable. Because you've got this person to come home to. So if everything goes wrong or you try... And you're ambitious, you do something and it fails, 
you've got this anchor, someone who's going to be home. It's... And in truth, that's why I've never left Tom, because he means that, and he, you know, he, he'll always sort of come back to just that. just poetry, isn't it? And mine goes... <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, your husband's name's Shane. Shane. Shane Bradley Cooper. Shane Bradley Cooper. Does Shane, does Shane Bradley Cooper make you more than you are, do you think? Does he make you more capable? I mean, not that there needs to be more of you, Effie. In a way, Listen, you are extra. Anyway. I know this is not what you're saying, but let me just say for the record, and this is not what you're saying. I've said that for the record. <laughs> but let me say this. This other half business, that's got to stop. This hole with the W. <laughs> that's got to stop. I am whole with the W. <laughs> and since I've been married with the H as well. This you complete me bizzo is crap. We know that. I get that someone, you know, can be your GST. <laughs> it's just a 10% on top of what is already an entire amount. You know, in Britain, it's VAT and it's 20%. Whoa. All right, we might have to pull that one back. 20% might be over, over, overstating it. But no. <laughs> that whole thing that I can't unless I'm all for someone saying, together, anything's possible. I reckon that's why we get married. We don't get married... You know, you can have kids outside of marriage. You know, you can do a lot of things outside of marriage. But I think we get married because we believe something extraordinary is possible with another person that gets you, sees you, loves you, accepts you, and all of that stuff. You. So I think that's why we commit. We go, this is the person for me. And I trust my husband and he's done the right thing for me for, for, you know, all the complexities of, that I come with, you know, to be coveted, to be drooled on constantly, to be hit on non-stop. It's, it takes a big man to hack that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because you're loved and you're famous and you're adored. And on public property in many ways, you know. Yeah. You're and adored by your public. That's it. Worshipped. That's... He's married a deity. For sure. He's married a Greek goddess. I mean... He's married Venus, basically. He has married Venus. It's true. Everything you've said is true. <laughs> Venus so, with arms. He's married. So how do you cope with that? Because you are in the public eye and people do love you. Now, how do you deal with that if you're out with Shane Bradley Cooper and someone wants to come up and talk to you? Listen, I understand. I, look, guys... Girls, we can't accept the good part of something and not accept the other part. Mm. We can't be standing or sitting in this particular case on this stage looking at these adoring faces that can't believe their luck <laughs> and not have to put up with a little bit of hassle. You can't have one without the other, you know? You can't have all the benefits of me and love me and adore me and not expect every other human being to have mm. those same feelings. <laughs> Tom Selinsky said to me, I can't expect to be with someone as wonderful as you and not share you with the world. Oh. I know, he's a lovely man. He's a lovely man. I feel like but you should have written Tom's Tinder bio. <laughs> like, no, he's a lovely man. But I, I had to marry some friends. Oh, as a celebrant, you mean? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> And, Good to clarify. And um, I wrote a speech, some of which ended up in a movie I wrote, because why waste work you've already done? Yeah, um, gold is gold. 
But I wrote it about my friends Olivia and Larry and said that the best marriages are those between an ocean and a lighthouse. Two oceans crash about. You've probably you know, felt like an ocean, you've met an ocean, and it's been fiery and passionate, but they crash about and there's no stability there and it doesn't last. And two lighthouses, well, it works, but it's boring. You wouldn't want to go on holidays with them. No, it's just a lot of... Ah. <laughs> you know what I mean. You know couples who are two lighthouses... They're both very, you know, stable, particular. They've both done their taxes. <laughs> if you and your partner have both independently done your taxes on time and neither of you have asked help from the other, or one of you is not running late, if both of you are early to the airport, I'm questioning it. <laughs> I think the best marriages are between a notion and a lighthouse, but, as I said to Larry and Olivia in The Vows, the best advice I can give you is take turns. You might think, oh, well, I'm the ocean and he's the lighthouse. But sometimes, if you are the ocean, you need to turn your light on and... No. You need to Give take... Her chance. She's getting there. You... <laughs> you need to take your turn to be the lighthouse and turn the light on and say, you go out and be the ocean and I'll be here with my light on when you come home. I'm the ocean in this marriage. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. <laughs> There's no twist, gang. Um, but sometimes I love it when Selinski takes a turn at being the ocean and mm. he goes out and he does an amazing, writes an amazing play or he goes off. And I'm, I'm always more attracted to him in a way when he has a little turn at being the ocean. And I kind of get excited about it. And I love being the lighthouse. I love being the lighthouse. Do you think you're the lighthouse or the ocean, Effie? Well, definitely on the ocean. I'm very highly emotional, you know, very expressive, very high into this free speech thing to the point where, you know, it never stops. <laughs> I am with a lighthouse, but this ocean has been with a dickhead as well. <laughs> and if you think two oceans are shit house, try to get an ocean with a dickhead. <laughs> I'm telling you. It's like you pay the lighthouse to not put the light on. You go, <laughs> you go and have a you know, nice early dinner somewhere. Um, look. Variety. You want someone that's not saying exactly what you're saying. You want a teacher. You want the opposite. You want the bigger picture when you're being petty. You want to be the bigger picture when they're being petty. You got to, otherwise, you're going to go mental. Because you, you can't, you know, Ill, we're in this life to evolve, to get to the other end and go, oh man, you know, that was tough. <laughs> but, you know, I'm better now, even though I'm, you know, slightly creased, <laughs> than I was at the beginning. I mean, you know, the hero's journey. Mm. You're not a hero if you're just, you know, taking a stroll. You know, you've got to get in that ocean, not a bay either. There's nothing heroic about being in still water. It's got to have movement. It's got to have sure. danger. It's got to be... We've got to hear it. We've got to surf on it. This has gone too far now. No, sure. <laughs> oh, my God. We've pushed that metaphor right out to sea. This is a bit of an I'm a feminist but. I'm a feminist but. I know the point of that was not when you said, well, when I'm old, I'll be creased. But your skin looks exactly... It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it looks exactly the same as it did in 1989. How, I tell you. how have you done that? What are you using? Well, you know, look, I like to say like those supermodels, it's all the water I drink. <laughs> you know, like when they're, you know, like a size... Two and a half, and, and they go, how do you look so good? And they go, oh, it's all that water I drink. Yes. Well, I guess there's a lot of it around, because you're the ocean, so you yeah. just... <laughs> oh, I love that. That one's a good one. <laughs> That's a beauty. Look, I do try to stay hydrated. Uh, but no, I, look, it's, it's all the olive oil. It's, uh, it's the attitude. It's the, the, it's the moisturisers. It's, uh, you know, I definitely uh, do not feel like I need to apologise physically or in any other way for having, um, 
you know, gone for it, you know, turned no. by style yeah. uh, in every which way but loose. Um, you know, I believe in uh, making the most of everything. This is what I got given, you know, God's gift. You know, I was gifted this for me, you know, to take it for granted, to treat it badly, to not moisturise, tone and exfoliate on a regular basis <laughs> would be not to respect the gift that I was given. <laughs> uh, do you have any advice for people perhaps who are just about to get married? Or people who are going through a rough period in their marriage? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what. You don't sell the best you and after the wedding show the shit house you either. You know, because we all, all on the first date, or oh, what are we going to wear? And oh, we, we try so hard at the beginning, some of us, and we sell them, you know, the best version of us, you know, the light, the gregarious. The, you know, the open, the easy going, and then the minute some people nab someone, and I, I, this is not a gender thing, it's, it goes both ways, then suddenly you drop the ball. Suddenly yeah. the ugly side comes out. Suddenly, you know, you're no fun anymore. You don't make an effort anymore. You know, everything, you start to become misery on legs. That is sort of the benefit of marriage, though, that you can do that. <laughs> That's sort of one of the perks. That's one of the main perks is that, you know, in the corporate world, when they say bring your whole self to work, yes. bring your authentic self to work, yes. they don't mean that. <laughs> because if you did, you would just call someone a twat and be fired within minutes. Right. Minutes. minutes. Right. What they mean is bring a bit more of your best self yes. to work and leave yes. your worst self for your family, for your husband, oh, your wife, gorgeous. your partner. It's true. That's who gets to... I think it's a compliment to show your worst self to somebody, in a way. I mean, not, not all the time, obviously. We should make efforts for our partners and our families, of course. But it is a compliment if you can be really vile. Because <laughs> you think, I trust you to see the worst side and love me anyway. Deborah, I'm with you. I'm not against you. <laughs> what I want to say is, totally, we are... Human. Mm. We are imperfect. When I say we, I mean you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I totally say you've got to show every part of you, but don't turn into some bitter, hard-to-please, ball-buster 24 hours a day after you've, you know, lassoed that poor innocent. And guys, no offence, they're thick. <laughs> Men are innocent when a, a woman can run the show, no problem. Greek women have been doing it since the beginning of time. <laughs> you know, so it, it's easy to get a guy to fall in love with you, adore you and do all of those things. But if you go from Jekyll to Hyde after, you know, once you've settled, you know, that's just not cool. That doesn't stink of longevity to me. <laughs> that doesn't stink of healthy to me. No. Yeah, you're right. As always, Effie. I don't think that sentence has ever been uttered before. Exactly. Does it stink of longevity to me? Yeah. No, that's a one-off. That's unique. But you should keep it if, and recycle it because it's, it's, it's we love sustainable comedy. I also wrote. I also wrote down. I also wrote down. Life as a visual medium because yes. I like life that so much. Life as a visual medium. Yeah, yes. absolutely. There should be T-shirts that say that, with just life as a visual medium, Effie. I did a debate for the Diversity Council of Australia oh, recently. Oh, I heard you smashed it. And the, the topic was, is it a good idea to bring our whole selves to work? Oh. And I was put on the negative side of that argument. Because my argument was, I'm Greek, I'm hot, I'm gifted. <laughs> That's only three things. If I was to bring any more of my other abilities and wholeness to work, it would be unfair to others. <laughs> It's true. And feminism is about equality. Feminism is about equality. So presumably you have to hold a lot of your gifts back in order to make an equal playing I'm field. I'm here to entertain, not to intimidate. <laughs> you know? Would I don't you... want to make anyone feel bad about themselves. Why would I do that? I love people. No. and uh, you... It's not fair. No. But with your gifts... It is difficult because, you know, there are people here thinking, I'd love to be... Yeah, why any... her and not me? Yeah. But 
You know what? Somehow, because of your goodness and your givingness, you're, you're, a, very, you're a giver, Effie. It's give, give, give. And because of your giving, somehow you neutralise that intimidation. Almost like a war tactic. Oh, I like where this is going. I feel like you could run this country, and the way that you change prime ministers every time I come I back, don't... you probably will. You know, the only thing about politics, because I've been asked, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, crazy, you know, things happening in Australian politics. And the only thing about politics that I don't like is that it's political. <laughs> <laughs> and by that I mean, you know, you have to compromise. Mm. And it's the compromise where the problems start, you know. Yeah. I would rather be socially political. Which is what we're being... Is that what we're being here? Because that's what yeah. I came here for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is social politics, for sure. I mean, it normally is. I don't really know what this is, but... <laughs> <laughs> this is... It's three oceans in search of a lighthouse. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. It's... You know, we've done a variety of shows here in Australia. Um, some more serious than others. All more serious than this. But... <laughs> I, this has been my absolute favourite because I feel like I'm on stage with a living legend. It's sort of the dream of a lifetime, really. I can't quite believe that I'm here with you, you know, when I was watching you on television. Don't say when you were a child, otherwise I'm going to literally, you know, throw this microphone at you. <laughs> Don't tell me you grew up with me. No, I... I, I Don't tell me that I, your mother and grandmother... <laughs> I, I would never say such a thing. And with that skin, anyway, who could prove it? So... Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Jessica Regan here. I'm delighted to tell you that due to popular demand, we are holding three big speeches workshops in London on the 12th of May, the 19th of May and June 2nd at the Hen and Chickens in Highbury and Islington. Please go to guiltyfeminist.com to book your place. Looking forward to seeing you there. through a sort of diversity and inclusion lens. Basically, there's no real reason to get married anymore because marriage, it started out as mergers and acquisitions. That's what it was for. It was two families merging and one family would acquire the other family's wealth. And now that reason has gone. One man is not effectively selling a woman to another man anymore. That's gone. And now it's much more a sort of cocktail of sort of fomance and financially efficient living. But the real reason we get married now is because your family are people who are legally obliged to include you. And so your husband or wife sort of has to include you by law, whereas a boyfriend or girlfriend does not. That's why we do it. It's basically to make excluding you and leaving you alone more expensive. So expensive that no one wants to pick up the price tag. I was like, I'm not picking up the bill for this. Shall we just stay together? That's basically what it is. Most people are staying together because it's too expensive and there's too much admin <laughs> to get divorced. Um, you're not going for this as much as I thought you would, which implies to me that some of you are happier in your marriages than I thought you were going to be. I'd made an assumption. But I do think, to a certain extent, this is true. Like, we kind of judge celebrities for getting divorced so often. Um, we go, oh, Jennifer Anderson, if you get another divorce, you're getting divorced again, you're getting divorced again. But the thing is, she can pay someone else to do the paperwork. <laughs> and she has a lot of houses. So, you know when you're so angry with your husband or wife and you just go into the, the other room and slam the door? Jennifer Aniston can slam a house. <laughs> and before she's calmed down, she can change the locks and call the divorce lawyer. And then your pride is not going to allow you to back down at that point. 
And if you don't think that's true of you, this statistic, think about it. When people's houses burn down, their chances of divorce go up by like 20 fold. If you go home tonight, if you're married and you own a home, I mean, I mean I'm in Sydney, so people are laughing, but <laughs> I mean, it's. But if you own a property of any sort, if you have a mortgage, and you went home tonight and that was burnt down, you would realize it was 90% of your marriage. Okay, people are really not going for this. They're, people are going, no, that's not true. I mean, this is a sort of, you know, a feminist hyperbole. Um, but this statistic is interesting. Two-thirds of divorce proceedings are started by women. Why, I hear nobody ask. Because we're better. Now, I wouldn't normally say that, but, I mean, we are, in this situation, better as famous feminist Rod Stewart once said, <laughs> he once said, I'm not going to get married again. I'm just going to find a woman I hate and give her a house. <laughs> the only reason I can think that Rod Stewart's marriages don't work out is because of the 75-year age gap <laughs> between him and his wife. He once said, my wife was one year old when I wrote Maggie May, and he was 98 when he said that. So <laughs> he's since then divorced her and married someone who was born after Maggie May was already a hit. I just think you shouldn't be married to anyone who wasn't even conceived when you had a number one record. <laughs> I just think that's a rule for all of us. It's just generically a rule for life. I think that some of the challenge of marriage, which does change, I think, when you get married from just being boyfriend and girlfriend, uh, is the in-laws. Because now there's sort of no getting rid of you. And so there is an escalation of something that can happen. And I have a group of girlfriends, and we all compare in-law stories. It's sort of sport. It's sort of like, if we ever have lunch together, we go, I've got one for you. Oh, no, I can't put this out. What if someone plays this to my mother-in-law? Okay. So sometimes I hear that women compare in-law stories. It, some women do that. It's a thing. It's a thing. We, you know, they get together and dis discuss in-laws. Uh, my favourite was a friend uh, whose in-laws are German. And she once said... Um, that she sat down to lunch and her father-in-law said, oh, my scrotum is so painful because it's so tight. As you get older, your scrotum gets tighter and tighter. Nobody tells you this. No, and nor should they. No. There's a reason nobody tells you this. At lunch, past the lasagna. I think the apotheosis of my you know, parents-in-law um, is that early on, and I... To explain before that we got married early on and we were in love if you're listening from the home office but or any legal department we were but we we got married sooner than we would have if it were not for the government's keeping us apart <laughs> they romeo and juliet you it's the last romantic reason to get married i'm telling you so my parents in law were not pleased when their incredibly young son came home and said I'm getting married tomorrow. Not thrilled. He said they would be fine. He said, oh, they read The Guardian. <laughs> They're very liberal. I was like, they... <laughs> Darling, they won't, they won't. Anyway, it's not an exaggeration to say they hated me. Understandably, they weren't thrilled. They thought I was a con woman. I don't know what they thought I was going to do him out of his overdraft. I mean, he literally <laughs> had an overdraft. But anyway, after a few months, they were trying to thaw it a little bit. It was very, very, very frosty. I think they thought there was one piece of common ground. I liked opera. They liked opera. Tom did not like opera. And they would like Tom to like opera. The story is very British, I realise, as I tell it here. <laughs> I liked opera. They liked opera. Tom didn't like opera. <laughs> so they thought, oh, perhaps this is a common ground <laughs> that we could stand on here in London. Um, <laughs> Let's catch the tube to the opera. Um, 
So Tom said to me, you'll never guess what. My parents have extended an invitation to me and you. And I was like, oh my God. He said, it's my father's birthday and they would like to take us to the opera. And I said, oh, well, that's really lovely and that would be really bonding and perhaps, you know, it'll all thaw out. And I said, what's the opera? And he said, it's Janacek's The Cunning Little Vixen. <laughs> so I had to sit and watch a four-hour, atonal, modern opera about an actual vixen, an actual fox in a fox outfit, <laughs> being foxy, who tricks a vixen, who tricks a fox into marrying her, and then at the end is killed and her skin is used as a coat. <laughs> it was a long night. I don't mind telling you. Because we weren't very good at the small talk yet. Anyway, I then did a BBC Radio 4 show which was all about, you know, sort of stories and things like that. So, when I did this Radio 4 show about them, Mary insisted on coming... And I was like, do you want to see a script first? Do you want to see... And she said, no, 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 it's fine. Anyway, so they came and they sat in the audience while I did the whole story and two of my friends played them as characters. <laughs> and this is the first time, this is the first time ever that Janacek's cunning little vixen had been brought up when they were in the audience and we were on the stage. <laughs> so at the end... Of the episode, you know, at the end, you know, they do pickups where you have to say, you know, something again because they didn't, Mike didn't pick it up or you said it wrongly or something. So that while we're waiting for pickups, I just said to the audience, just so you know, Tom's parents are in the audience tonight, and the whole audience made the noise you've just made. <laughs> and I said, "Are you still there, John and Mary?" And there was a pause, and then John said, "Yes, we're still here." <laughs> and I said, "Are you happy with everything?" And he said, "Well, it's too late now if we're not." <laughs> And I said, just got to ask, from this safe distance, because we've never discussed it, Janacek's cunning little vixen, was that deliberate? <laughs> and he said, oh, not exactly, but uh, we realised after we'd got the tickets and we told our friends and they thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to say before we close the show? Because I just want to make sure you feel that you've left it all on the table. I'm a Mercedes. <laughs> Physically, mm. I'm heterosexual. This no is not what I was expecting. To any of the <laughs> to any of the lesbians here that are hoping that you know they could get lucky tonight. Physically, I'm heterosexual. But psychologically and emotionally, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> it gives me such great joy to be up here with two women. Look at it. We're like Neapolitan ice cream. <laughs> Every flavour. So many boxes for me, this whole experience. Firstly, I'm going to say, you guys, this audience, are the most amazing, vocal, psycho, brilliant audience. <laughs> I'm telling you, from the minute this podcast started, you guys have been peaking. So thank you so much. <laughs> You are rock stars in every sense of the word. And you guys, you, Deborah, forget it, it's that English accent. It kills me. I love it. You sound so smart. <laughs> I mean, if our accents were to compete... Even with the glasses, even That more. doesn't hurt either. <laughs> you look like you should be in the front row of a fashion show. Mm. Or somebody's, you know, muse. <laughs> Instead, you're everyone's amuse. <laughs> You are a class act. You are my comical Nana Muscuri. 
And Cal Wilson, you are the cherry on top of this comical cake. You are adorable. You are bright and no one does sound effects like you do. So thank you for, uh, for having me, guys. It's been an absolute dream. Oh. It's, it's been remarkable. Now, I have written down here the details of your shows. Your show, Effie, is called Love Me Tinder. And it's on Saturday the 11th of May at the Camden Civic Centre. Friday the 17th of May at the Concourse Concert Hall, Sydney. And Saturday 18th of May at the Factory Theatre, Sydney, right here. Is there anything else you'd like to plug, Effie? Nothing. Just come out and see the show. Yes, I be mean, a, it a is. Right this evening. Live, you know, I've done obviously television, we all have, and we love it, and all of that. And it's, you know, it's convenient and, and all of that. But there is nothing like. What's happened? <laughs> there is nothing like the live experience. You guys are listening to this stuff at home, doing what you're doing, you know, traveling, doing. But when you're here, when we are face to face, there is a whole other level of experience in the collectiveness of it all. And I, you need to see me to believe me, <laughs> is what I'm saying. It's true. 30 years of been treading boards and I want to entertain you, so please let me do that by coming to see Love Me Tinder. Go. It will be my honour. Sydney, get behind the show. Come out in May. You will not regret it. Cal, do you have anything to plug? Uh, I, uh, I have a kids' book out called George and the Great Bum Stampede. Um, <laughs> please go and buy that, even if you don't have a child. Even if you don't have a Just child. To support Cal. It's sort of autobiographical. It's not in any way. Um, and my show, Gifted Underachiever, we bring it to Sydney. It's going to Perth. It's going to be on the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. So come and see me do that. Effie, I'm so in love with you. I know. You are just I know. I want the this best. to go on. I want this night to go on forever. Uh, we should just quickly say that you can find us on Twitter, you can find us on Instagram. I'm at DF Dubs on Instagram and I'm at Deborah FW on Twitter. And we're also at Guilt Fem Pod or The Guilty Feminist on Instagram. Cal, who are you online? Uh, on Twitter, I'm Calbo, C A L B O. On Instagram, I'm Calbo Wilson. On Facebook, I'm Cal Wilson. Marvellous. Effie, where can we find you on social media, surely? Mine is pretty simple. Every single time, it's Effie Good Thanks. <laughs> Page to be positive. <laughs> Get onto my Instagram, Facebook, whatever. I want to stay in touch. Okay, you know, to a degree. <laughs> and if you could rate, review, and subscribe and give it five stars, that would help other people find the podcast. <laughs> and if you don't, if you don't give this episode five stars, you're ungrateful. Okay. <laughs> You have been listening to The Guilty Fabulous with me, Emma Francis White, guest co-host Carl Wilson, and our very special guest, Effie! The producers were Tom for the Spontaneity Shop and Jeff Brink for Australian Comedy Management. Music was by Mark Hodge. Thanks to everyone at the Factory Theatre, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfabulous.com! So we have to be quiet at the beginning because they, you're, they're listening on public transport. You know, normally you're listening on the 27 bus. Is that a bus in Sydney? No. What's a bus? Three three three. We'll go there again. Normally you're listening on the three three three. It's not as good now, is it? It's a bus that's halfway to hell. <laughs> You're listening while sitting at the Oyster Bar on the harbour. Um, all right. Let's have a look. Now, the Guilty Feminist is going on tour. These epic shows will not be recorded, so you'll have to come and see them for yourself to know what's in them. We have a fantastic lineup of guest comedians and singers for you. Here are just a few of them. 
Hello, I'm Grace Petrie and I am so excited to be joining the Guilty Feminist Live Tour this year. I'm going to be coming to Cardiff on the 15th of May, Cambridge on the 16th, Southampton on the 22nd, Sheffield on the 23rd, Coventry on the 24th, Plymouth on the 25th, Brighton on the 26th, Glasgow on the 29th, Leicester on the 30th, Nottingham on the 31st and Woking on the 1st of June. I really hope to see loads of you there smashing the Patreon. Hello, I'm Catherine Bohart. This is take 147, but here we go. I am very excited to be joining the Guilty Feminist Tour on May 19th in Oxford. It's going to be fun. It's always fun. And we always have a good time. I mean, those mean the same thing, but I've said them now. So here we are. May 19th, Oxford. See you there, hopefully. Well, hello, um, I'm Jenny Eclair. Just checking then. I need to wear a name badge, can't remember who I am, where I am. I'm at home at the moment. But guess what? On the 2nd of May, I won't be at home because I'm going to be in Birmingham with um, the live Guilty Feminist podcast thing on the stage. It's going to be marvellous. You're an idiot if you miss it. That's all I can say, really. Um, be there or be square, as we used to say in the old days. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm hugely looking forward to it. And... Um, I hope you are too. Hi, I'm Mifa Queen and I'm thrilled to be joining the Guilty Feminist podcast tour in May. I'm going to be singing some songs on the following dates, Thursday the 2nd of May in Birmingham, Friday the 3rd of May in Hull, Friday the 10th of May in Colchester, Friday the 17th of May in Aylesbury and Saturday the 18th of May in Bournemouth. I'm beyond excited. It's an amazing lineup um, and can't wait to see you there. Hello, this is Jess Robinson and I am absolutely thrilled to be joining the Guilty Feminist Tour on the 1st of May in Halifax, the 4th of May in Newcastle, the 5th of May in Salford, the 11th of May in Richmond, the 12th of May in Southend and the 19th of May in Oxford. I'm absolutely over the moon. I can't wait, guys. I hope that you will all be there and we will have a wonderful time and live happily ever after. Ow, I hit my hand. The end. Hello, I'm Jessica Fosterkey. I'm excited to tell you that I'm joining the Guilty Feminist on tour. It's uh, all through May. I'll be doing a little bit of stand-up on the 9th in Ipswich, on the 15th in Cardiff, on the 16th in Cambridge, on the 17th in Aylesbury, on the 19th in Oxford. You're right, there's loads of these. On the 23rd in Sheffield and on the 24th in Coventry. See you there, please. I think it's going to be really fun. And it doesn't stop there. We have Sindhu V in Halifax Hull, Newcastle, Salford, Leicester and Nottingham. And we have Bridget Christie in Colchester, Aylesbury, Bournemouth and Southampton. We have Felicity Ward and Kemar Bob in too many places to list. We also have Angela Barnes, Grace Petrie and many more. Go to guiltyfeminist.com slash tour to see the full list and to book. <laughs> 